So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining the session. Um, my name is Julia Mercado, and I volunteer with Indigenous Physical Activity and Cultural Circle. Um, I just want to introduce Brian and Justin again. Welcome back. Um, and Brian is currently a full-time kinesiologist faculty member at the University of Fraser Valley in Abbotsford, where he teaches exercise physiology, exercise testing and prescription, strength and conditioning, and post-rehabilitation techniques. He earned his master's and bachelor degree in kinesiology from the University of British Columbia. And he's practicing as a clinical exercise physi physiologist, a kinesiologist, an NSCA certified strength and conditioning specialist, a CHEK level two practitioner integrated health coach, a functional movement screen evaluator, an advanced health and human performance specialist, a movement and performance therapy specialist, a champion performance specialist and an NSAM performance enhancement and corrective exercise specialist. Today, Brian will be speaking on the 21 point safety inspection for fitness professionals and coaches part two. Building on his previous presentation, movement for managing stress and trauma part one, Brian will lead a 45 minute movement class where all you need is some space and a yoga mat. So welcome back, Brian. All right, thank you, Julia. And because everyone's returning, I, I, won't, uh, I won't go back to the, some of my introductory stuff I did earlier. We'll just get right into part two. And um, all right, so, um, so we're, we ended off uh, before lunch at on 10A, we have 21 to go. So we've got uh, 11 left to do. So we're on 10B though. And um, this one might be hard for you to do depending on if you have any wall space. Um, for anyone that is just joining and wasn't in part one, feel free to join in on any of these um, movement, in a, sorry, in a safety inspections that we're doing. Um, feel free to try them out. I'll try and give you some time enough to try them out yourselves and to get the feel of them. The goal at the end of this work, uh, at the end of this workshop is that you can take some of these and try them out on clients, try them out on athletes that you work with, whatever, whatever you, wherever you find yourself working in, in terms of in terms of movement, so whatever venue you're at. So, so uh, we're gonna continue on from 10A to 10B, and we're gonna look at shoulder flexion range of motion slash thoracic extension. So this is my colleague at UFE, uh, Dr. Joanna Shepard. And so I had her do this test, and this is a great test to, um, to be able to um, assess shoulder range of motion to flexion pattern. And also at the same time, look at the mobility of the thoracic spine. Our upper T-spine tends to get really stiff from sitting um, and from being in flexed postures. And so it can affect your ability to put your arm overhead. So if you're trying to you know, um, play a sport where you're overhead, or if you're you know, trying to get to a last branch, if you're picking something, um, or if you're putting something away in a shelf that's high up, with a thoracic spine that doesn't let you do it, it's gonna put more force into your shoulder or potentially somewhere else. So how you do this test, if you have a wall, go ahead and find yourself um, going up to near the wall right now and place your, your back, your buttocks and your head all against the wall. And then if you want with your feet and just take your heels about a foot away from the wall. Okay, so if you're on the wall currently, you should have your heels should be about a foot away, but your buttocks, your back and your head should all be on the wall. And then just slowly with your thumbs pointing up, just take your arms overhead and see how far you can get. But here's the thing. If no one's here to watch you, what you have to do is you have to try and feel for it. So as you go up, do you feel your ribs flare forward? Do you feel your low back arching? Do you feel your head wanting to come off the wall? Those are all indicators that you may have some limitations, probably in your thoracic spine. Most people are pretty good, unless they've had an injury with their shoulders, most people are pretty good with shoulder flexion itself. But the last 40 degrees of, of getting your arm overhead is largely predicated upon your ability to extend your thoracic spine. So you can see in the picture, if you're not at the wall um, trying it yourself, you can see I had my, uh, I had my uh, friend Joanna here purposely arch her back and flare the ribs more. So the yellow arrow shows her back arching, which means she's pulling extension from somewhere in order to get those arms overhead. And then she's also rib flaring, um, but which usually occurs. So th those are just two ways to identify it. So you'll either see the low back arch if you're from the side view, if you're in the front, you might see your ribs start to push forward. And that's just telling me she's pulling movement from somewhere else in order to get her arms overhead. 
So if this person goes to play volleyball or any overhead sport or do anything overhead, they're going to have to rob motion from somewhere. And either they'll rob it from where those arrows are or they'll rob it from their shoulder. And next thing you know, they've got shoulder pain. Uh, they might be doing an overhead press if they're in the weight room and they'll probably overutilize the, um, the shoulder because it's not moving efficiently. So, um, so this is a really important test to do uh, for most activities. A lot of times our arms are going overhead in sport and in the gym as well. So hopefully you had a chance to try it. If not, you know what to look for now. And next time you go to the gym, um, just take a look at people doing shoulder press. You might see all the, uh, all the ribs flaring and all the low backs arching and you'll know, uh oh, that they're pulling movement from somewhere else. Okay, the next one is uh, this, uh, number 11 is balance. And we're gonna do the eyes open version of the C set one. And so I'm gonna get my timer out here to time all of you. Okay, uh, oops, stop watch, there you go. Okay, so what we're gonna have you do is we're gonna have you do a balance test. Now, if you have any shoes on right now, if, you, if it's okay to take them off, that would be great. Um, if you take off your shoes, because we're gonna do more than just this test. So I'm actually gonna switch slides for, as, as to the next slide. Here's some things I want you to observe for while you're doing this test. Don't worry about the left-hand side. I'm gonna talk about that one after, because it's gonna be hard for you to look at that on yourself. But I want you to observe for signs of instability when you do this. So are you clenching your jaw? Are you making faces? Are you biting your lip? Are you, changes, are you changing your breathing? Are you holding your breath or breathing faster? Are you clenching your fist or are you toe grabbing? So just take a note how comfortable you feel in this position. Okay, so let's do the test. So I'm gonna time you. So what I want you to do is just cross your arms so that your hands are over your shoulders and then just stand up uh, uh, in, in, by your computer or wherever you want actually, wherever you feel comfortable. Um, and we'll start on your left leg. And because I'm left-handed, so I figured I'll start with left leg. And uh, the way you'll stop the test is if, um, if your arms move, so for any reason your arms come off, if your raised foot moves away or, um, or towards your standing limb. So let's say you're on your left foot and your right leg goes out and then back, then that means the test is over for you. If the weight bearing foot is moved to maintain balance, it's either rotating on the floor because what happens is if you're your brain is like, okay, I like my, my foot straight, but if I turn it, I get a wider base of support. So it's kind of a cheat mechanism. So if your foot moves for any reason that then the test is over, or if we hit 45 and I'll let you know if we hit uh, 45. All right, so we're just gonna do your left foot to start. Okay, ready? And just slightly bend your right leg so that your foot is off the floor, but not touching the other leg. And we're just gonna time you. And again, just note for yourself, are you, do you find yourself clenching your jaw? Do you find yourself making faces, biting your lip? Sometimes people will push their tongue outside of their mouth, like they're, they're trying to think about something. Uh, changes in breathing, if you're holding your breath or if you're panting, uh, like breathing faster. Did your breathing change to a shoulder breathe breath? Are you clenching your fists for any reason? Are your feet grabbing the floor like crazy those are signs of instability okay that's 45 seconds if you didn't notice any of those signs of instability and that was easy congratulations let's check your other leg out so let's go to the right leg slightly bend your left knee so your foot's off the ground but make sure it's not touching the other leg and i've got the timer started and again while you're doing this as you hear my voice are you, is there any differences? Do you feel like you're more stable on one leg versus another? Did you feel your hip jut out in any way compared to the other side? And do you have any of those instability signs? So your jaw clenching, making a face, biting your lips, changing in breathing, clenching your fist or grabbing the floor for dear life with your toes. So these are all things to look for. And it's a nice, simple balance test to, to look at that neuromotor fitness aspect. Okay, and that's 45 seconds. Perfect. So um, 
on average for males between 18 to 49 years old, 41 to 44 seconds seems to be the average. For females, you tend to do better at 42 to 45 seconds. So, uh, so if you're within those averages, awesome. But what I'm most concerned about when I do a balance test besides the time is those signs of instability. What, that, what that's doing is when, you're, when you see a client or an athlete do that, those signs of instability are signs that they're not comfortable. It means their sympathetic nervous system is now on because it feels threatened. And that usually means that they don't have good balance. So even though they may make the 45 second time limit, if they have those signs of instability, it'd be worth it to put some balance exercises into their program, whether you're an athlete or, or the average general population. Another thing you can observe for as a coach or as a trainer is did their trunk bend sideways towards the stance leg? So if they were on their left side, did they side bend towards the left? And that's a great way to show you that their glutes aren't doing their job. And because what's happening is they're turning their, their side bending their body over the stance leg to make it easier on that glute medius in particular, glute max as well, but glute medius in particular, um, by shortening that lever, by bending over, they make the lever shorter, which means they don't have to put as much force to keep them upright. So it's a cheap mechanism. So you want to watch for that. If they trend Dellenberg, that means the side of the hip where the leg is up drops down if you see that in other words you'll see their hip pop out to the side that's another thing to observe for and again we're looking at a weak butt there um arch collapse did their feet just arch? maybe they had a nice arch and then suddenly bang you see them flatten right out uh usually that's concomitant with the knee turning inward kind of goes with it and do you see any pelvic rotation did you see the pelvis actually turn as they did that so compare sides and just take a look because that tells you how well they can accept weight on that one side as well. And if they're an athlete, if you have one side that's way worse than the other, then you know the side they can be played on when they're playing their sport as well. So comes in handy for that. If they ace that test, you can go on to a further test in a, in a formalized testing environment and do the Y balance test. And if you're not familiar with the Y balance test, if you just uh, Google search that, you'll get plenty of information on how to do the Y balance test. And it's a fun test for doing dynamic balance if you're working with athletes. Okay, so for our next test, if we can have you try this one too. Um, if you stand up and do the waiter's bow, we're assessing hamstrings without lumbar movement, but we're also assessing a client's ability to pick things up. So if I have you stand, and what I want you to do is to pinch some skin on your lower back. So you can just pinch your skin right through your shirt, and, uh, and just try and make it like a horizontal skin fold. And then what we're gonna have you do is keeping your knees straight, I want you to bend forward, but stop as soon as you feel any skin leaving your fingers and just see how far you go. And if you get to at least 50 degrees, you're doing great. If you're going further than that, even better. And what this tells me is how well someone can hip hinge. So for those of you who are trying it right now, if you can get further than 50 degrees, my guess is that you probably do maybe some kettlebell work or you do some deadlifting or you've um, or even done some gymnastics uh, in your past. And that means that you're not bending through your spine, which is awesome. Because what happens is if the skin leaves your, your fingers right away, that tells me you're bending right through your lumbar spine and not using much of your hip. And then so that tells me if it's a new client, that tells me how they're going to put their weights away. That's going to tell me how they're going to pick them up. And, um, and so it also tells me a little bit about their hamstring flexibility potentially. So as a, as a safety inspection, you, it gives you an idea of their habits. It may not actually tell you about their hamstrings unless you get them to do it properly. So you recorrect them after and say, okay, now I want you to hold the skin here, push your butt backwards. And if they can do that, that means their hamstring flexibility was probably fine. It just means that their habits, but that they like to round their back first. So for example, if, you, if any of you were the ones that just your, um, your skin left your fingers before 50 degrees, then all I would cue you to do is I would say, okay, hold that skin. And then now what I want you to do is push your butt backwards. Like you're trying to punch a punching bag behind you with your butt. And what that does, it gets them pushing their glutes backwards and then makes them hip hinge better. And if they can do that, that means their hamstrings are totally fine, just means they have bad habits. And that's good to know because they can cause injuries um, just by not paying attention to how they move. So I love the waiter's bow for that one to give me a couple of clues about how they move. 
Can you say that one again? Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. That second part, please. Sorry. Sorry, which one? Second part where you push back. Oh, yep. Yeah, yeah. So if you're holding your skin fold, then what you're going to do is you're going to push your butt backwards as you lean forward, like you're trying to punch a punching bag with your butt. And what that does is it forces you now to hinge, to hinge your to hinge at the hip so that you're, you're not using your lumbar spine to pick up a load or to work through. Okay, this next one, number 13, I would have to say could be one of the most important ones that you'll do on this 21 inspection um, outside of the breathing one. Um, we have uh, an issue with ankles that are have tightened up. And for all of you on this call, I'm guessing probably you've either been an athlete are currently an athlete and are also probably training athletes. And there's a good chance that you probably rolled your ankle more than enough times. I know for me, I've rolled my ankle a million times playing volleyball, basketball, and everything else under the sun. And so ankles tighten up based on that. So this dorsiflexion, uh, closed chain ankle dorsiflexion test is to give us an idea of how well your ankle moves forward to back. So the the, the easiest way to do this is if you have an iPhone that's reasonable in terms of its length. I know like, so there's some phones that are like large and crazy and it's crazy size. Um, so if you have like, a, this is an iPhone 10 here. These are about five inches, roughly 5.25 inches in length. You can use this as a method to um, just to put this on the wall and then put your toe on the other side of it. And that'll give you five inches. So so that start with that first. Um, and then, so what you're going to do is with your shoes off, you're going to place, uh, let's, let's start with your right foot. So you're going to place your right foot at the end of your, at the end of your phone. So that'd be five inches away from the wall. And then you're going to place your left foot just behind you comfortably, like in the picture. So just, it doesn't really matter where that left foot goes, as long as it's in line. So your pelvis stays in line. Now, all I want you to do, and of course I say all I want you to do, but for some of you who have tight ankles, you're gonna have to be like, what? Um, is keeping your pelvis straight. You cannot turn, keeping your knee over your foot. You can't let your knee cave in and out. I want you to touch the wall with your kneecap. Just move slowly, but make sure that your hips are not turning and make sure that your knee's not moving inwards. It's going over your second, third toe, over your shoe, not over your second, third toe. Um, and if you can do that, awesome. Hold on to that for the rest of your life. Uh, if you can do more, give it a go. If you can do, if you can't do that, then go ahead and bring your foot closer and closer to the wall until you find your threshold in terms of your ankle mobility. So our ideal is five inches. For some of you, if, if you're uh, shorter of stature, then three inches sometimes will be enough. Um, but five inches is usually the norm. Uh, that way that we go for if you're taller you may have to go more than five inches and this is largely really important because we have found that people who have really bad ankle dorsiflexion when they squat in the gym they'll be the people that bow forward when they squat and um and also they'll be the people that complain of knee pain when they land from jumping they'll be like oh my knee hurts or they develop um uh shock lots of shock up their leg as well this is so important because um, if you're picking up a box from the ground, if you have limited ankle mobility, you'll probably crank out your back more than, um, <clears throat> than, than the average person. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to get my throat a little dry. So I'll try both, try both ankles. See if they're the same. Sometimes they're not because if you've blown out an ankle on one side more than enough times, it'll probably be less than the other. So if that made sense to everybody. I just had a question about that one. Sure. Um, do both of your um, feet need to be fully planted on the floor as you're bending? So the back leg as well? No, just the front leg. Okay. Yeah, the back leg can come up um, as long as the, when the back leg is coming up, that the hip is staying um, straight. You don't okay. want it turning, that's all. Okay, perfect. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Sorry. So why do we care about ankle flexion? Well, it leads to knee pain, leads to back pain. It can, ref it can affect your squat mechanics. And an immobile ankle will transfer all the load when you're landing or lifting heavy into your knee. 
um, as well. So that's why we, we do care about it. And like I said, next time you go to the gym, if you see that person who's squatting and their back's going into this bowing motion, like almost like a good morning or a deadlift, look at what their ankles are doing. <clears throat> You'll probably see their shins very, very vertical and they're not getting that motion to move forward. Okay, next one is toe extension. And believe it or not, toes that can move are absolutely critical. And um, most of us have stubbed our toe. So we often get first MTP joints. How many of us have walked around? It's like, oh my God, <laughs> I don't know. I've done it so many times. And it's like, usually the worst words that you ever know come out when that happens. And, uh, and so it really, really kind of hurts. So the easy test for this is you have uh, to stand on one leg and then raise your big toe up as high as you can go actively. So you're not, I mean, no one's pulling it up for you. So it's an active test and see uh, just by, because uh, you know 45 degrees is a good diagonal, right? So 60 degrees is going to be a little bit more than that. So see if you can get 60 degrees of toe dorsiflexion coming off the ground. Um, your other toes may follow you. That's okay. It's hard to really separate them unless you've been doing some of the, you know, the toe shoe stuff and things like that. But see if you can get 60 degrees. And then if you want to test it passively, you can just put your foot on your lap and then just pull your toe back and see if you can get 70 degrees passively. And try both big toes. Would this add this type of work add to your vertical? Yes, it would. And I'll talk and I'll explain why um, in that reason. Because if your big toe cannot dorsiflex like this, you can't fully use your gluteus maximus muscles very well with hip extension. And so you'll lose some force coming out of the thing. What happens is your foot has to turn and then push off and that becomes that becomes an energy leak. So big toe, big toe dorsiflexion, absolutely critical for getting your glutes to work both in walking or if you're if jumping or anything where you're extending your hip. It's really, really crucial, especially on a jump because you have to be able to, you have, you have to be able to transfer that force through that, through that toe. What ends up happening is if people have a really, really tight toe, um, they will end up with uh, bunions. And so, because if you're, if you're walking, for example, and your, and your toe won't move, uh, what will happen is your, your foot will say, okay, well, Brian's toe isn't moving. So I'm going to turn him this way. And then you end up pushing off of that where you see that bunions form. So uh, that often leads to, to bunions and bunions. Unfortunately, once you get them there, they're there, unless you have to surgically remove those things. Um, if you, if you, if you do get them and often you'll notice that your big toe, uh, normally it should be sitting straight like this. It'll turn, it'll turn in a way. It'll, it'll start to move towards your pinky toe if it doesn't move well. So, um, I'm going to show you a little thing to help your toes out right now, because I, this is, this is how important it is. I want to take some time to actually show you how to correct this. So what you do is if you just put your foot on your lap right now, I'll just sort of cue you through because you won't be able to see, cause I can't move my computer. Um, just put your toe on your lap and what you're going to do is you're going to actively draw your the, the back of your toe up towards your shin now take it as far as you can go actively and then once you can't go any more active grab your toe with your index finger and your big and your and your thumb i was going to say your big thumb but your thumb <laughs> um, and just gently pull traction it and pull back for two seconds and then let it go and then let your toe come back and then try it again, pull back actively, grab traction, and then pull back for two seconds, let go, let it come back. Try three more reps on that. And what you'll start to notice, generally we do 10, but just because of time, I'm only giving can you do five. Um, by the 10th one, you start moving further and further back. And just try it on one toe right now, the five reps. And then I want you just to quickly walk around for, for a second and just notice the difference between your, your, the toe you did and the toe you didn't do. And you might notice that it just feels really nice and feels very more fluid when you walk. It's even better when you can hit 10 reps, but, um, but, um, but you might notice um, a little bit of a difference. I had my students do this in my class the other, um, a few weeks ago, and they're like, what? <laughs> they're there, they could feel the difference between their foot. Now, if you already have a really good moving toe, you might not feel any difference, but if you, your toe was tight, you might notice, oh, wow, I can move a little bit better. And you might even actually feel your glutes contract a little bit better as well as you walk. So, but normally it's 10 reps of that, two seconds each, and uh, that usually gets your toe moving pretty nicely. 
And then just keep doing that as part of your warm up. Um, so poor toe extension leads to these problems, increased eversion and pronation, which we talked about creates more of the that turning motion, compensations at the lumbopelvic hip complex and the ankle and knee, increased eccentric forces on those muscles, I won't name them all, don't worry, and then um, IT band issues, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, patella tendonitis, low back pain can all result from a big toe that doesn't move, who would have thought? And why does our big toe do that? Because we live in shoes. That's the only problem. We put them in, we put them in, a, I call them toe coffins. We put them in toe coffins and then they're like, they don't move very much. And then we ask them to move. Um, and then they're, they're like, no, I, I'm used to not moving that much. So, um, so definitely uh, incorporate that into, uh, into your warmups. Next one is sitting hip rotation. So this one, um, if you look at the picture, is we'll do the internal rotation first. That's the top, the top picture. So uh, if you want to sit at the edge of your chair, and then all you're going to do is that this is where I have to get you to monitor. So I'm going to get you to monitor your pelvis and your leg in terms of movement. And what you don't want to see is you don't want to have them move upwards. You don't want to move your spine in any which way either. You want to keep yourself perfectly still. And all I want you to do is to turn that leg inward, outward, sorry like like the picture showing there so you got to be really strict to make sure there's no movement coming from anywhere else because what that means is that you're robbing it from somewhere else to get it and just see if you could pull off 30 degrees if you felt your if you felt your thigh lift off the chair you cheated if you left your if you left your if your spine started moving you cheated if you turned your spine you cheated so uh that's the first one. So just do both legs of going outwards and just visually see if you can get 30 degrees. 30 degrees means that your foot would have gone just outside your body um, and where your body is. And then the other way is to go inwards. So we should get a little bit more. Um, so external rotation was the foot going inwards. And the same thing again, don't let your leg rise up. Don't let your spine change and see if you can get 40 to 60 degrees on this one. So just be sure to stop the leg movement just prior to any pelvic movement. So if you feel anything in the pelvis going, that's it, stop before that. That just tells you that your body's going into another joint in order to move. So why do we care about this one? Um, if a client or athlete does not have enough hip rotation, they will have to pick it up somewhere else. So their lumbar spine will pick it up. The only problem is lumbar spine only has 13 degrees of rotation, which means it's not designed to move. If you remember back, if those of you who have taken anatomy class, you'll remember that the lumbar spine facet joints don't really allow you to rotate too much. It was your T-spine that did. And so if we lose anything in our hip, we will pull it for where we need to do it. Because remember, your body loves you unconditionally. If you say, I want to go this direction, it'll take you there, but it'll find a way to do it. And maybe it's not going to be as good as you want it to do. Um, the other place you can grab some motion is knee. But unfortunately, we call an excessive rotation of the knee an ACL tear. So we don't really want it coming from there. Um, we will lose power during gait related activities because all of gait is rotation. It's T-spine and hip rotation. And so uh, our walking becomes inefficient and becomes more costly. So if you have someone who likes to hike, for example, they're going to have a costlier hike if they don't have much rotation. And, um, and then hip flexion activities occur with internal rotation. So when you go into a flex position in your squat, your hip does have to internally rotate as part of that motion, or if you touch your toes, so if you don't have the ability to internally rotate, you're, it's going to affect your ability to squat or run as well, because um, on your back leg, you're also going to internally rotate as well as you go forward. So the stretch that you can use and um, uh, is the 90-90 hip stretch. It's a great way to get external rotation on the front leg and then hip internal rotation on the back leg. So the one pictured here. Um, is an awesome, awesome, awesome stretch to go. If you, um, because I don't have time to go through it here with you, if you look up a video on YouTube by Ryan DeBell, so it's Ryan, R-Y-A-N, D-E, Bell. He does a great job of, of breaking down the 90-90 hip. Just go Ryan DeBell, 90-90 hip stretch. And he, he spends like 10 or 15 minutes 
just explain the nuances of how to line that up properly and how to really, um, really, really get the benefits out of that stretch. And so he's a chiropractor who loves this one as well. Okay, torsion control screen. This one's going to be a tough one. Let's see how you do. Um, so you're going to start yourself off in a push-up. So this, this screen is about learning how to control rotation. And so it's, it's a two-parter. So this is the first one. The first one, you're just going to get into a simple push-up position. So just like here on the top left, that's your start position. And actually, his arms could be a little bit further in. So you want it just underneath the shoulders. And then, um, and then you're going to simply touch the elbow of the other arm and then the elbow of the, and then you'll switch it to the other side. And poor control will look like this one here. So you'll see this unlocking of the pelvis. So you can see, and it's really hard to see, but his shoulder is in the somewhat same spot, but his pelvis has rotated the other direction. So when you see your road shoulders and, and pelvis rotating in different directions, that's telling you that you don't have good control of the ro of rotation. And then for this part of it, you're then going to raise the leg up. So you'll bring one leg up and you just want to assess to see, do you feel your pelvis moving? and your shoulder uh, moving in opposite directions or are they linked together? Okay, so that's what we're looking for is does the pelvis and the rib cage, are they locked together or are they doing this? That's really what we're looking for for the most part. You may list over a little bit, that's normal because you're going onto one leg, oh, sorry, one arm, um, but uh, a little bit of listing is normal, but if you rotate in different directions, that's when we know that there's a torsional lack of control. So if you want, I'll give you a few, uh, I'll give you 30 seconds or so to try, try them out and see how you do. So uh, and I'll sort of just explain as we go through. So remember you're in the push-up position with your shoulders, hands underneath your shoulders. You're gonna touch the elbow of one side and hoping that your pelvis and rib cage are locked. That's what you're going for. Then once you finish that, raise up your left leg, right leg, and see if you can also keep your pelvis locked in with your rib cage so that they're not torsioning. So look through all the people there. I'll make sure people come back to their screens. If you're not back to your screen yet, don't worry because, oh, oh yeah, there are, we're all back now. Okay, so now the next one, torsion and screen control number two, so that was like a top down approach. Now we're going bottom up. So um, if you want, just go ahead and lie down. I'll explain this one after, I'll explain how to do it now while you're doing it. So go ahead and lie down on your back with your knees bent and you can bend your knees roughly at 90 degrees. And what I want you to do is just to do a bridge the way you normally would do that, the way, the way you'd normally do your bridge. And then I want you to, keeping your thighs together, straighten one knee and just watch what your pelvis does. Does your pelvis rotate? Does it stay the same? Or does it drop down? Or does it stay the same? So you're looking for two things. Did it rotate? Or did it drop down? Or did you get one hell of a hamstring cramp? That might be, you might get one of those too. And that just tells you about the, the twisting control of your glutes. Can your glutes control and modulate uh, rotation? This is a great, I call it a glute test as well, because it gives me a chance to see how well someone can use their glutes. how efficient they are at contracting it. So if they suddenly tell you, oh my God, I got a wicked hamstring cramp, uh, that tells you that their, their hamstring is kicked in and to try to do most of the work for them. And that's probably why it didn't work out so well because the hamstrings don't have a really good pull in rotation, um, whereas the glutes do. And so, um, so we're looking at that. And if, you have, if you're able to hold your position from twisting or from dropping, awesome. That's great. Now, for those who didn't, so for those who had insufficient torsion control, it'd be a good idea to avoid dynamic rotary activities. So like, you know, twi uh, cable twists, 
medicine ball twists, things like that, until they develop that torsion control. Otherwise, they may have a uh, the propensity to over rotate. And so you can do anti rotation exercise like the one shown here. This is known as the Pavlov press. It's named after John Pavlov, who created it. And so basically, this person is starting with their arms bent, with a cable pulling them to one side. They straighten their arms out to make it even harder to hold that position, but they have to use their abdominals and their glutes. You'll feel everything kind of turn on to, uh, to be able to hold that position. You can do something called renegade rows where you're in a push-up position and he's pulling uh, like, a, like a bent over row, but he has to maintain that pelvis locked onto his rib cage. And then for the bridge side of things, you can do a bridge, but then you can also, while you're up there in your bridge, and if you wanna try these after the call, is you, you, you bridge up and then you turn your pelvis to one side while holding it, then turn your pelvis to the left side. And you can have fun with this and you can, um, you can go up, you can turn to the right, for example, come down to the floor and you're still twisted, go up, turn to the left and then, to, and then come back down. So you can teach your, your glutes how to control pelvic movement in rotation as well. So you can practice holding in the position and then practicing controlling rotary movement so you can have fun uh, with that and let me tell you your glutes go on fire doing that one it's awesome okay so spinal flexion so this is our number 18 and so for this one just grab underneath your chair and what i want you to do is keeping a nice upright posture just pull straight down so you're pulling your so you're, like you're pulling yourself into the chair so pull yourself into the chair and then now what you're going to do is bend forward, like in that horrible computer posture position, and then pull down again. Now, if someone gets pain when they do this, I would often refer them out. That's telling me this, that there could be something of an intradiscal nature that's causing them to get a little bit of pain. It might not mean their disc is um, herniated or anything like that, but I don't know that. So then that's what I want to have them checked out for. So, so if they, if they, bend forward and they pull down they're like oh my god that hurts actually um i would have them get looked at uh just send them to a chiro or a physio to get further assessment done if they are okay they're like yeah nope feel good they can go on to the, that the full spinal flexion test which is what you see right here it's also known as the prayer stretch you sit back on your heels and you just want to notice do they have any pain and in terms of how far they go back if their heels can touch their butt great if not, you can always put a pillow in between if they have some knee issues uh, where they don't have to build them. They don't have to go as much as a knee flexion um, with the pillow in between their, um, their calf and their back of their leg. So, um, so that's the spinal flexion test. You don't have to do that one right now if you don't want to. Um, but that's just the need for me to test is spinal flexion good. And then now spinal extension. This looks like the Cobra. And so I often will have people do this. And then when they do this, I often want them to tell me how it feels, not just how far they go. So on this test, she's actually pushed up a little too high. We actually want the, where my arrow is. You actually want that part of the pelvis on the ground. So, um, so they're going to push up until their, their bones in front of their hip are just about to leave and they stop right there. If I was to measure this, I would measure from the sterno, sterno, um, the sternal notch down to the table. So the sternal notch is right here. You want to feel this little spot in between your shoulder, um, your collarbones. There's a little notch in there. I'll just take a measuring tape straight down to the ground. And if they get 12 inches, awesome. Um, but what I'm really looking for here is what do they feel in the front of their body? Is it feel like massively tight? Because there's, there's a lot of people who are very, very crunch happy and they do a lot of crunches in their fitness classes and that brings them into this posture. And so then what ends up happening is when they go this way, they're like, ooh, I'm not really giving much here in my, in my abdominals. And then that tells me, okay, maybe we should avoid a little bit of flexion activities until we can get them to have better flexibility in the front. Because we do lose spinal extension um, as we age, and we want to maintain that as much as possible. If you do this test actually dynamically, where you breathe in and oops, breathe in and push up, and then breathe out and come down. It's a great back saver stretch for those who have to work in front of a computer. It feels amazing. You do 10 reps of that. As you breathe in, you push up. And as you exhale, so when you're ready to breathe out, you just exhale and then come back down. It feels so awesome on your spine. Feels so good. 
because we don't spend enough time in extension because of our chairs. We sit way too much in flexion. If you wanna try that, go for it. You, you can keep trying it if you like, if you uh, like it while I carry on here. Good job for trying that, Maddie. Good job. <laughs> All right. Now the, the number 20 is um, requires this set square, which is this tool right here. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a way to get an idea of what their arch integrity is like. And I got this from Dr. Tom Michaud. He's a chiropractor that specializes in locomotion. So he does a lot of research with, um, with regards to locomotion and running. And he's written an entire book on just human locomotion. Uh, probably one of the best books I've ever um, seen on it. And it's, uh, it's called Human Locomotion, if anyone's interested, by Dr. Tom Michaud. But this test, uh, this, I'll just explain how to go through it. I'm just going to get the uh, pictures here out of the way. Hold on a second. Okay. So where my arrow is, the first thing you got to do is you just have to measure the length of the foot. So from the heel to the end of the big toe, that would be A. So that's 22 centimeters in this case. And then you would divide that by two to get the halfway point of the foot. So that would be B right here. Okay. And then... Um, and then, so uh, once you have that halfway point, then you're going to measure the, um, the actual height of the arch. So you would take your set square, put it beside the foot, and then you would bring this down until it touches the top of the foot. Take your reading. That's your arch height at the halfway point of the foot. And then you're going to remeasure the foot length again, but only up until that bone that you feel at the start of the, of the big toe. So if you feel your own big toe right now, since your socks are off, remove your your finger down like where your big toe is, you'll feel kind of a bone stick out. That's what you're going to measure too. And it's right where the, um, it's the end, where the MTP joint is. And so, and so that measurement is the one that you're going to divide your arch measurement by. So in this case, it was 17. You'll take six divided by 17. And in this case, we got a 0.352 arch integrity ratio. And with the norms here that you see on the slide, that would be considered normal, a normal arch. If you're less than that, it's considered a low arch. If you're more than uh, 0.356, you're a high arch. So lower than 2.75, uh, your low arch, higher than 0.356, you're considered a high arch. Now, if you don't have that tool and you don't have that tool with you, you can also use an index finger test. Now, um, you're gonna you're gonna laugh, but I've actually have uh, followed this for a long time now, where I've had a lot of students, like hundreds of students every year, correlate this arch integrity ratio to a simple index finger test. And it's, it's, um, it's been basically 95, actually maybe 99%, because it was only one time where it didn't correlate. And I have a feeling it's because they might have did it wrong. But, um, but, the, um, but an index finger test is super simple. All you do is you take your own index finger, and if, if uh, and, you, and you look at where the first digit of the index finger ends. Now then take your index finger to your client and match it up and see if they're the same length. That's the first thing you have to do. If they're not the same length, then you got to find another finger for your client. So maybe it could be your pinky that lines up with it. Because let's say you got someone who's five foot two and who's measuring an arch of someone who's six foot five. They're going to be a little different in terms of their digit lengths, but you got to find a digit length that mat tends to match and all you simply do is put your index finger in the highest part of their arch and see how far it goes in. If it goes into the line, perfect, that's a great arch. If it doesn't go in very much, you have a low arch. If it goes past that line, you've got a high arch. And I have found it to be really, really easily correlatable with this particular test. So this one gives you some nice quantitative numbers that you can monitor your foot if, if, if there is a foot change. Um, the other one's just a nice quick test if you need to just check someone's arch um, prior to training. So either one tends to work really, really good. But I like this one because you get some uh, monitoring of, of data. Okay, our last one is the VT1 testing. And so this test, um, I've actually made it part of our curriculum at UFE because um, we do a lot of testing on people and we do traditional cardio testing. Usually we're telling someone, while well, you're either poor, fair, needs improvement or whatever it is, right? And sometimes that can be 
useful information. A lot of times it can be kind of disempowering for someone if they're a client. So, um, so I love VT1 testing because it's information I can program off of. So we know that with max heart rates, if we use the 220 minus your age formula, you can be off. So if someone was 20 years old, for example, their technically their max heart rate should be 200 beats a minute, but the standard deviation is 12 plus, minus, plus or minus 12. So you could potentially be off by a lot. And if they fall within the second deviation, then you could be really, really off. And so um, this could either lead to overtraining or undertraining. Um, and so now the ACSM in their latest edition have kind of discouraged using 220 minus your age or using uh, formulas to find a max heart rate. If you're going to use one, use the Tanaka formula like I got down here because at least it drops it down to plus or minus seven instead of 12. But this is where VT1 testing comes in. So if you were to do a max test on somebody, and so for, for those of you who aren't um, kinesiologists in the audience, let me just explain this quickly. Is if I was to do a max test on you, your breathing will start to get deeper as we start to move up in intensity until the point where then you have to start breathing more frequently. But as you move up in intensity, there's going to be a point where you hit two different thresholds. One's called your VT1 threshold, and it's just when your talking becomes just starts to begin to be a little bit uncomfortable. And then you have VT2, which is your traditional anaerobic threshold where talking really becomes uncomfortable. And then you can only say anything past that for a little while before you hit max. And so VT1 testing is about finding this out, where breathing just starts to become uncomfortable. And in other, in other circles, it's called the talk test. But what we're finding out is a heart rate at that talk test. So how you do the test is real simple. Make sure they pass all their blood pressure and heart requirements as you screen them out. And then you have to then determine a protocol with your client, which is awesome because that means you have to individualize this test to them. So let's pretend I'm doing this test on somebody. Well, I've got five minutes left. I just got the notice here. Um, let's say you're doing this test and let's say they're a hiker. And so they have a certain speed they like to walk at. Um, and I know that they like to, hike, like to hike in the mountains. So what I'll do is I'll change the incline for the test to make the intensity start to go up. So I might say, okay, well, I'm going to then make you go up 1% incline once we start the test, but we're going to keep your speed the same as your usual walking speed. So that way it's isolated individualized to them. So I'll warm them up for three minutes, get their heart rate to roughly 117 to 120. Once they get to that point, we start the test. Each stage is two minutes. So for the first minute, I'll take their heart rate. At 30 seconds later, I'll take their heart rate again. And if it's within five beats of the first one I took, great. That means they're at steady state, which is perfect. They're not climbing still. I'll ask them to recite the alphabet for 30 seconds. So they'll recite the alphabet. And what I'm trying to hear for is whether it's uncomfortable, challenging, or do they, um, are, are they getting a little bit of gasping? At the end of that 30 seconds, I'll say, how did that feel? And they'll say either, either was it easy, uncomfortable to challenging or difficult. If they say it was uncomfortable to challenging, they reach their VT1, note their heart rate, that becomes what, the, what you train with. If it was hard, then we know we passed it. <laughs> and if it was way too easy, then I know I have to go another stage. So I take them up another percent incline until I find out where they start to, where it starts to become hard. So let me, let me show you this video and it kind of illustrates it. Whether you work with sedentary clients, competitive athletes, or a wide variety of fitness levels, you can use the ACE integrated fitness training model to help each client reach his or her unique goals for health, fitness, or performance. The ACE IFT model has four cardiorespiratory training phases. Each phase- Sorry, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna fast forward this part because you I just went through that part. I just want to get to the part where you hear her breathing. Sorry, I will get to the video soon. The yeah. training phase has guidelines for exercise programming in one or more of these zones. Marion is going to exercise in each of the three zones to help you identify the respiratory changes that occur at VT1 and VT2. Heart rates at VT1 and VT2 can differ between cycling and running. So you should assess cyclists using a bike and clients training for events that include running using a treadmill. Marion has been cycling at a steady pace for a few minutes now. How are you feeling? Feeling good. Can you recite the alphabet for us? Sure. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Good. That's good. Marion is exercising based on the talk test in zone one. 
which is below VT1. Exercise can be sustained at this level for a long time. Let's increase the intensity now to find the point where talking first becomes uncomfortable. How are you feeling now? Okay. Can you recite the alphabet for us? Sure. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Good. How does reciting the alphabet, did it feel comfortable, a little bit uncomfortable, or not at all comfortable? A little bit uncomfortable. Marion has just reached the first ventilatory threshold. At this point, it's important to record heart rate as the heart rate at VT1. Okay, so... So you, can, so you can see how she gasped a little bit, right, when she was doing that uh, recital. So that's when you note the heart rate and you can say, aha, that, that's when you've hit that first ventilatory threshold, which would be considered her aerobic threshold. And so now we can program off that, especially if they're beginners, this works really great. So, so let's say VT1 was 130 beats a minute. Let's say we were at that when we, when we got there. Her zone one will be 120 to 130 and her zone two will be 130 to 140. So now I can train her between these zones. Um, if, I, if I stay in zone one, I can keep that as steady state training. If I wanna do aerobic efficiency training, I can then go five minutes here, five minutes here, come back to five minutes here and go back and forth. And you have to do at least three minutes though in each zone because that's when you'll hit steady state um, to get the aerobic system going. So you can go back and forth and how many intervals you do depends on how much time they have available or how much they can recover from. But by testing this way, I can get some actual usable information. Once they become more advanced, then I can test for VT2 as well. And then guess what? You can make a zone three now where you can go from below VT1, between VT1 and VT2, and then VT2 and above. And that's when you can start playing with actual data. And you don't have to do a max heart rate test on them to do this, which is safe. And you don't have to use formulas, which are inaccurate. So that's why I like doing VT1 testing. It works great for athletes. It works great for seniors it works great for anybody and it's a great way to use actual data on them and you usually test every 16 sessions because it can change with training so if they've been doing 16 sessions with the training then it will change and they can um and they can look at it again and see how uh, how much they're improving so i love et1 testing for that reason because um, it allows us to uh, to safely get someone involved with uh, cardiorespiratory training uh, which is what the idea of the safety inspection was for. So now this chart here, it looks at all the different activities that you can do roughly, and then what inspections would be advisable to do in order to see if they're ready to go for those activities. So if they want to do overhead activities, for example, they would look at these inspections to see, are they, are they, is there anything that has to be corrected or is there anything that has to be warmed up a little bit more in order to do that one safely? Or if they're doing squatting and lunging, here's these. If it's a hinging activity, let's try the waiter's bow, uh, that sort of thing. So those are just a little guide point um, and to, um, to, to know which ones you want to do if you want to do them on the fly, if you don't want to do them all at once. So, um, so that's my presentation. Um, I will, uh, someone asked if I, if I can get these slides out and I will, I'll send them to Sean for those who may want the slides if you want to try them. But thank you for your attention. And uh, if there's any questions before we, get moved into a uh, into another room, <laughs> um, feel free to ask away um, or, you, or if there's anything in the chat, I don't know, um, I can go there as well. Thank you, Brian. That was an amazing presentation. I, personally, I learned a lot that I didn't know before and I had a really good time with the whole interactive experience. If anyone oh. has questions, they can unmute or type it into the chat. I was just trying to be quiet for once and let somebody ask us a question. <laughs> okay. Hey, Brian. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for your amazing presentation. And I have a question regarding one of the exercises you were showing. Sure. Um, I don't remember which one was, I think was around the 15 or 16 okay. i don't remember which one was okay let me uh, uh can you please sure yep i'll go back to there yep uh yeah 16 yeah okay so um there's a clear example of a poor control for the image d no yes. 
Uh, you got this one. No, right it's, here. it's for the for the image B. Okay, so sorry for so uh, so we have start good control and then poor control. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So if that's an example of poor control for the position B, which will be an example of poor control for um, the picture D. Okay, so a poor one there would be um, you would see the leg kind of dip down and the pelvis would start to turn. You start to see it turn. So this, so imagine this leg right here, the one that oh sorry, I'm right this one leg here. So imagine that you that that leg is starting to now move towards the ground and then this pelvis is dropping on this side. Mm -hmm. you'll, that that's what you'll probably see for poor control. So that will imply that the pelvis is weaker or something like that. Yeah, that means their their core, their glutes, and their abdominals are not being able to hold that pelvis locked onto the rib cage because this pelvis is now starting to move down, but the rib cage is staying where it is. And so now they're they're unlocked. And so uh, that means they're both their core or their glutes, um, particularly the glutes on the other side, are not doing their job. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome.